Hey everyone, Dr. Jack Audi here, and in this video I'm jumping into how does DNA and RNA sequencing work? The modern stuff, what happens when you send your samples off to get sequenced or run it in the lab? How are they sequencing that DNA and RNA? So let's jump into it. I want to point out that this is just one of the common techniques. There are actually a few others, but they the principles are kind of similar across all of them. So um, what you'll learn here will certainly be useful um, in all the different techniques that you might be using. This is one of the most common techniques, though. so let's jump into it. First, I just wanted to point out that the first genomes to sequence literally cost billions of dollars, um, and now we're down to around about $1,000 uh, a genome, which is amazing. You could get your genome sequenced if you wanted. I don't know if you want to know, but sure, um, you can get your genome sequenced. And it's actually been a faster development than computers, which followed this thing called Moore's Law, which we can see here. But you can see the price of sequencing genomes has dropped considerably, and a lot of that is because of next-generation sequencing, which I'm jumping into right now. Okay, so first up, let's just do the steps. First one is frag and tag, right? So we're going to fragment the DNA and tag it, um, attach a little barcode that we call um, onto it. So we take the DNA and we uh, fragment it up into lots of little bits. We can do that enzymatically, which is what you just kind of saw, but you can also use it with um, like uh, high energy beams of some sort to fragment up the uh, DNA. Now we then split it into single strands for sequencing and then we add a little double strand at the bottom to tag each piece of each fragment. Now these are going to act actually as a primer and if you don't know what a primer is make sure you watch my PCR video but it's a double stranded bit of DNA on which we can now extend and elongate. We can attach nucleotides to the end of that double stranded DNA and build up our sequence. Um, so now we've got these little bits of double stranded DNA attached to our single strand DNA and so we've fragmented it and tagged it with our little barcodes. What we do next is we then attach it to, to a surface. This can sometimes be a bee, but it's often actually just a glass slide. So we attach it to a glass slide, just like this. Um, and now what we're going to do is we're going to incubate and elongate it. So we're going to essentially wash solutions over the top of the glass slide, which will elongate the DNA, and we'll make recordings as we go along. You'll get what I'm talking about here. So, for example, we might incubate it in thymine, um, it will actually be deoxyribothymine, um, and uh, so it'll be a little nucleotide. So it, we're now putting in the thymine nucleotide, the nucleotide associated with thymine, and we have put a red fluorescent tag in it. We've also put in a DNA polymerase. That's the enzyme that we need to attach nucleotides to the DNA to extend it, okay? So what's going to happen now is on the fragments that have an A, an uh, adenosine available for the thymine to attach to, the thymine will now attach with the help of the DNA polymerase. So the thymines have attached to this strand and this strand because there's an adenosine right there just above the double-stranded bit of DNA. So over here, we must have different nucleotides, like a C or a G or a T. But over here, we have an A, which the thymine, we're now incubating it with thymine, can attach to. So we have successfully elongated just these two bits of DNA here, but not these bits of DNA over here. So now what we do is we run a laser across it, and we look for the fluorescent sparks at that specific location in the glass slide. So as we run a laser across, we get that fluorescent tag fluorescing, and that is recorded. Where exactly did we get that little burst of fluorescence? And so it was above this strand and this strand. We've now recorded that there was a thymine attached to this strand in this strand of DNA. So now we can conclude that this strand has an A right there and an A right there. And now what we do is something very clever. We run an enzyme through that trims off the fluorescent tag here. So this enzyme should come through and trim off the fluorescent tag there, which is nice. And so now we're ready. We've got no more fluorescence on our glass slide. We're ready to attach more nucleotides to our fragments here. So here we go again. Now we're doing cytosine, the nucleotide. We're incubating it in our solution and we've got our DNA polymerase there and we get uh, cytosine attaching here here and here with the help of our DNA polymerase so the DNA polymerase enzyme is needed for each of these steps there and now we're going to run our laser across and see where we get the bings we get bing 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 right and so now we can record that those fragments there had an attached cytosine which means they must have the corresponding guanine there 
So we've got the G there, and we know that this goes A and then G, because we recorded the A at this location first, and now we're recording a G there, and we've got an A there and G there. And hopefully what you can see is by doing this over and over again, you can slowly, eventually, sequence all your fragments. So now you get your fragments, how do you turn this into a full piece of DNA? Well, you assemble your fragments by looking for the overlapping regions of it. You haven't put one strand of DNA in, you've put a lot of strands of DNA in, all overlapping, and they will all fragment at random, at different locations. So now when you sequence your fragments, they're all going to be overlapping, and you can build it up like a puzzle piece. Now, computer advancement has really helped ne next generation sequencing. Now we can use computers to very quickly um, assemble our sequence. So here's one of our fragments, and here's another one of our fragments, and due to this overlap, we know that this is a continuation from that fragment there. And so now we can build up our entire sequence, which is this. So now we have sequenced the genome of the thing that we just put in there. So we put in more than one copy of DNA, have fragments at random locations, we sequence all the fragments, and then we can overlap those fragments like a puzzle piece in order to deduce our single genome. And there's our single genome there. Nice. But how do we make this even faster? Much must go faster, must go faster. This is Jurassic Park. This is one of the reasons why I love being a biologist. First movie I ever saw in the cinema. I was six years old, and they were talking about all of this in the movie. DNA, replicating DNA, filling in blanks of the DNA. They were talking about all of this. Anyway, must go faster, must go faster. How do we... Well, this technique feels a bit slow, right? One nucleotide at a, at a time across all the fragments. Admittedly, the fragments are normally about 70 nucleotides long, so it only takes maybe 70 cycles to get through them. But how do we do it faster? And the answer is, this is another 90s film, more lasers. We need more colors, and with more colored lasers, we can do more nucleotides at a time. So here we can see the A's are yellow, the T's are red, the C's are green, and the G's are blue. So now we can do it all in one step. So we incubate all our nucleotides along with our DNA polymerase. We can run it all simultaneously. And now we run our multiple laser colors along the top there. Here they go, bing, 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 bing. And so now we can build up our sequences. So you can see very rapidly each cycle, and now you chop your fluorophores off, and then you do another cycle and another cycle. Very quickly, in 70 cycles, you'll get your, your, all your fragments done, rather than having to do four nucleotide types per fragment. So multiple colored lasers really accelerated the next generation sequencing. Now, that's DNA sequencing. How do we do RNA sequencing? Well, we extract the RNA from the sample that we're interested in. Now, remember, RNA quantifies how turned on a gene is. Is it not turned on at all, like keratin? The gene for keratin in my brain is not turned on at all because I do not need that skin protein in my brain. Um, but maybe during... Um, uh, if I've got eczema, perhaps my keratin protein is turned dialed up to 11 in my skin rather than just being where it should be, sitting at a 7. So um, RNA quantifies how turned on each gene is. So step one is we, all we do is we take the RNA, we keep it at the same levels, right, because we want this to be comparative, and then we do reverse transcriptase. We turn it into DNA, and then we sequence it. And so there are advantages and disadvantages to DNA and RNA sequencing. So uh, DNA sequencing is most often not quantitative. Normally we just want to find the mutation or find the person's genome. Um, we're often looking for mutations or genotypes. So um, do I have the gene for Alzheimer's disease or uh, there isn't one gene, but there's many. Do I have a risk gene for Alzheimer's disease or do I have a mutation that causes cancer? That kind of thing can be done with DNA sequencing. Um, or it can also be a whole organism. Am I, how related am I to a chimpanzee, for example? But it is sometimes quantitative. So let's run through examples. So why are you looking for mutations? It might be for cancer, or do you have a risk gene for dementia? Why might you be doing quantitative DNA analysis? A good example is what have you been eating? So ecologists will look at poo and see how, how many fish versus squid do you find in the poo of a sperm whale, for example. And so you can quantify the DNA of the poo to quantify what they were eating upstream. Um, another example is what bacteria do you have in the poo? So do you have dysbiosis? You do that by measuring um, the quantity of certain genomes. Um, 
you can't just look at one or two genes and then you sequence those genes to see what diversity of bacteria you have in your poo. Apparently I was obsessed with poo during those examples. So with RNA sequencing, it's almost always quantitative. We want to know how turned up all those genes are. Um, and so which genes are turned on and by how much and so an example might be if I inject you with a bacterial toxin called LPS what genes are turned on and by how much so you might expect a lot of inflammatory genes to go up like cytokines for example so we could measure all the cytokines simultaneously which is quite amazing that's one of the amazing things about RNA-seq is we can look at all 20 odd thousand genes simultaneously to see what's happening with your genes now one complication with RNA sequencing is it's hard to know whether the genes are turned up or whether the cells have changed so for example someone with if i get a lung biopsy from a healthy human and a lung biopsy from a covid19 patient and i look for an inflammatory gene uh, maybe a neutrophil gene like mpo that's a gene that we typically only find in neutrophils right so we look for that gene and we see that we get way more of that gene in the SARS-CoV-2 patient. So we see way more MPO and we see way more neutrophil elastase and we see way more um, IL-8 receptor, all these other genes that are associated with neutrophils. Do we see more of those um, do we see more of those RNA transcripts because there are more neutrophils? or because the neutrophils are more inflamed, right? So it could be one or two of those things. Um, do we have more neutrophils, and that's why we see more neutrophil elastase, or is there the same number of neutrophils, but the RNA is dialed up, and so now there's more neutrophil elastase per neutrophil? It's one of the complications of RNA-seq. We get around that. I can't go into this with amazing technology called single-cell RNA sequencing, where we're able to do RNA sequencing for every individual cell in our sample, which is mind-blowing amount of data but it's very very cool so with RNA sequencing and with the DNA how do we get quantity well it just comes down to the number of whole transcripts that we can assemble so here you can probably see that we've got different fragments all together and it lines up to a certain number of RNA transcripts maybe four maybe three maybe five so sort of thing so it's a way to um, we just assemble the fragments together and we see how many fragments do we get how long is the gene how many fragments would we expect to get um, and how many complete RNA assemblies do we get basically that's how we quantify in RNA sequencing um, and so there's another little thing that I really want to go through on this, and this is where I'm coming up next. So we can use these diverse approaches like DNA sequencing and RNA sequencing to understand how drugs work using very, very cool techniques such as um, experimental evolution and DNA sequencing or RNA sequencing to look at the pathways to see if we can guess how drugs work based on what's happened to your genes and how they've turned up and down. And so they're going to be coming up in my next couple of videos. Thanks, Dean.